Hello and welcome to Dialogue Gospel Study for October 10th, 2021. We're excited to be talking about Doctrine and Covenants 111 through 120 with Dr. Ramona Kutri today. I'm Rebecca Deschweinitz and along with my friend and fellow Dialogue board member Chris Kimball, I'm happy to welcome you all. As usual, those of you who are with us live on Zoom or Facebook today are welcome to post respectful and relevant comments and questions. We look forward to integrating those into today's lesson. Professor Kutri is an experienced Zoomer, so I think plans to be paying attention and following along and doing some of that herself as well. We're excited to have Dr. Ramona Miley Kutri, who is an associate professor of, of teacher education at Brigham Young University as our teacher today. In her teaching and research, Dr. Kutri promotes intellectual and emotional engagement with diversity and inclusion as an integral part of recognizing the structural and individual nuances of equity, power, and oppression. Teaching online and with TikTok are her favorite, and you definitely have to check her out on, those plat uh, on that platform. She has served as a Relief Society and Young Women's President multiple times as a bishop's wife once, uh, but her favorite calling is Girls Camp Cook. Ramona joined the church at 12 years old and without a doubt has experienced the healing power of Christ's atonement. She is one of my favorite people at BYU. I am personally grateful for the work she does there and can testify that she has shared Christ's healing power with students and colleagues alike and I'm delighted to have her be part of Dialogue's Gospel Study. As is always the case, the views expressed in this venue are those of the individual teacher and do not necessarily reflect those of the Dialogue Foundation, Brigham Young University, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or any other organization. A reminder that if you missed any of our previous lessons, they are all available as podcasts or videos and linked at dialoguejournal.com, where you can also find the entire 50 plus years of the journal with all of its amazing art, poetry, personal essays, uh, fiction, sermons, and scholarship. We'll add today's lesson to the others. It'll probably take a little bit longer since... Um, uh, Michael Austin is uh, across the pond, and so that also means that Chris and I are on our own with all the tech, and we hope that it runs smoothly enough uh, today. In the first issue of the journal, founder Eugene England wrote, my faith encourages my curiosity and awe. It thrusts me out into relationship with all creation and encourages me to enter into dialogue. To fulfill Jean's vision, in the 21st century, we have made all we have made the journal all 54 years of archived issues and all of our new digital offerings, including this gospel study series, our podcasts, and other features, entirely free for online users. We have figured out how a digital model for the Dialogue Foundation can work, have set a budget and made a plan, and are asking for your help in creating a fund that secures the future of Dialogue. You can find out more at sustaining dialogue about sustaining dialogue at give to dialogue.com. Uh, today we will be, begin the lesson with music, the hymn Lead Kindly Light, performed by the Lower Lights. After the music, our opening prayer will be offered by Tamu Smith. Uh, she's a popular and essential multimedia personality. You all likely know her as one part of the dynamic Sisters in Zion. She is the co-author of an online blog and various books and films. Her friend Ramona describes her as a loving and strong mother to many. At the end, we'll close with a, with a prayer uh, by Heather Sundahl, whom some of you will recognize as one of our previous gospel study teachers. Heather is a writer and editor for the Utah Women and Leadership Project, the BYU Arts Partnership, and helps run the op-ed op-ed lab for Mormon women for ethical government. She received a BA in humanities and an MA in English at BYU and is currently pursuing a master's in marriage and family therapy at UVU. Her passion is women's stories. In pursuit of this, she has worked with Exponent 2 for 23 years as a contributor, blogger, editor, retreat presenter, and president. She lives in Provo with three of her four kids, three cats, and one husband.
Chris, you're muted. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to start over. <laughs> oh. Where's my... Um, See, this really is a team effort. We do need you, Michael. <laughs> I'll get there. Share screen. There we go. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this day and we're thankful for the opportunity that we have to be here and, and participate in this discussion with um, Sister Ramona Kutri. We are grateful for all that we have, and we're grateful for this um, opportunity that we have to deepen our relationship with Christ. We're grateful for this discussion and everyone's willingness to participate. We are grateful for this platform that Dialogue has, has provided for us to gather together and participate in Jesus's name because we know that we're two or three are gathered in his name. There he is also. Father, we pray that thy spirit will be ever present with us. We pray that the devices will work the way that they are supposed to work. We pray that thy spirit will fill us. And we pray that as we participate in this discussion, that our relationship with Jesus Christ and our heavenly parents will be deepened. We pray that our dependency will be on the spirit as opposed to the flesh. And we pray that, that as we gather and hear these things and participate, that our hearts and our minds will be open, that we will be able to receive whatever revelation for ourselves that we need. And we say these things in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much, Tamu. And I wanna say thank you to everyone, um, especially Rebecca for inviting me to be with you today. And I am very grateful also for my two prayer friends. Um, I like that term. I, I think I'm gonna assign people to <laughs> ask people to pray for me more often. And, and these two women have definitely supported me multiple times in various ways and I'm so grateful for them and I too am grateful for this technology that um, has really saved me uh, from loneliness in in many times throughout these last two years so I'm grateful for the people who invented it who make it possible um, and I acknowledge that I don't even really know who they are but I'm grateful for them and I'm grateful for this beautiful land. I'm here in Utah and acknowledge um, all the people who this land belonged to before me. And I'm grateful to get to be a steward of a little part of it um, here in Utah. And um, with that, I'm just going to go ahead and dive in. Um, so I'm going to pop over here and share my screen. Yes, I'm a Zoomer by, by choice and by um, <laughs> necessity with teaching. So today, uh, Rebecca already said um, what uh, sections of the DNC that we're going to study, but I want us to just look at this list um, for a minute. Financial crises, uh, violence, death, property loss, social strife, infighting, speaking out, 
discord within the church. And I know that as I look at this list, um, I have personally experienced at least one of these things. And I think um, as all of you look at this list, probably at least one or two of these jumps out as experiences that you've either had this year or in 2020, or have been in proximity to, or felt empathy for someone uh, suffering through these <clears throat> conditions. And obviously the conditions um, are the exact ones that the saints in the sections of the Doctrine and Covenants were experiencing back then. And um, the fact that I personally can relate to at least one of these in 2020 and 2021 um, brings me to um, a sense of reality, um, makes me think of the people in the Doctrine and Covenants um, as a bit more relatable, um, which is something um, I'll, I'll talk about later that I usually have, have never done. Um, but these things all bring up um, big emotions for me, big feelings, as we say, um, to little kids. And I am sure that they did the same for our forefathers um, back in the Doctrine and Covenants time. And so what I really want to focus on today is trials of loss and contention. I am not a historian um, or big into scriptures. And so um, I might not be focusing so much on the trials of loss and contention that the people during the Doctrine and Covenants time experienced, but I am unfortunately very confident that all of us here together today have our own trials of loss and contention that we can share um, with the purpose of learning from those. And like Temu said in her opening prayer, growing our relationship with Jesus Christ and our heavenly parents. So that's going to kind of be the theme, this trial of loss and contention. So um, the similarities that exist between back then and now, um, I think are clear without any explanation. And I think the questions really remain the same. As I was reading these assigned um, sections from the Doctrine and Covenants, um, the questions that stood out for me were ones that really resonated for me in 2021. Can all of my trials really be ordered for my own good? How can I humble myself enough to let God lead me by the hand and answer my prayers? How can I find refuge from the storms of today, whether those storms are temporal or spiritual or a combination thereof? So those questions that that the um I heard or, or perceived the early saints to be um, wrestling with, again, really brought me a sense of closeness um, to them and that God um, has not changed his uh, approach in the sense that I feel compelled to answer these same questions in 2021 as they did way back when. And one of you historian people can chat with whatever the dates were because I don't remember. So, um, all right, come on, let's go. What I'd like you to do is um, we're not going to um, deal with the, your answers to these right now, but I would like you to take a minute and um, you can share in the chat. The chat is not anonymous, as you are already aware. Or you can just maybe jot down on a piece of paper if you have one handy, or call up um, your heart and see what your heart's answer is to this, because I'm pretty sure that the answers to these questions are written in your heart. And the questions that I want you to consider and that um, later on in the lesson we'll um, discuss together are, what have you lost that has caused you profound distress? 
And again, the loss might be temporal, spiritual, combination thereof. And I also want you to write down or to call up or to put in the chat, what contention have you experienced that has broken your heart? And again, unfortunately, even with just the um, one, two, three, four, four panelists who are showing up on my Zoom, I personally know that they could answer each of these questions. Um, and I do not say that with joy at all. And I know that I could answer these questions with, um, with very real lived experiences. So I invite you to share those either in the chat or if they are a little bit too close to home to share without anonymity, please write your responses down. As you're doing that, I just want to send out some love and recognition um, for what you have experienced. I, I can't see all of you, uh, but like I said, I'm very confident that all of us in 2021 can have an answer to both of these questions. And um, sometimes these aren't things that we share in public, and I don't need to know your specific answers, but I do want you to know that I recognize you and that you um, have most likely experienced this distress and sense of brokenheartedness. So we'll get back to your answers to these questions a little bit later on in the uh, lesson. All right, come on. It's not happy with me. I'm gonna stop sharing and jump out for a minute. Um, so as we go along, BYU must be listening. <laughs> the BYU IRB page keeps showing up. Rebecca will get the, the, the irony of that joke. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. We're just going to do this manually. Um, somebody who I can see, which is Chris, Rebecca, Tamu or Heather, will you, um, as I begin to share my screen in just one moment, read this scripture for me? And I will fully confess that I don't want to read it because I have no idea how to pronounce some of the words in this, <laughs> in these two verses. So somebody else, please read for me. I can do it, Ramona. This is Heather. Thank you, Heather. And I'll muddle through it. Help them repent of all their sins and of all their covetous desires before me, saith the Lord. For what is property unto me, saith the Lord? Is there not room enough on the mountains of Adamon Diamond and on the plains of Olaha, Sheneha, or the land where Adam dwelt, that you should covet that which is but the drop and neglect the more weighty matters? Thank you. <clears throat> and the words that I want you to focus on um, in these two verses that Heather just read for us is the, um, or the phrases, for what is property unto me? And um, basically, why are you sweating over the one drop? And what are weightier matters? And as I read this scripture, uh, these two verses, I have some really big things to answer. <laughs> What's property unto me? I'm a mom. I have children and the property in which I dwell right now, which as before I said, I know has not always been mine, but for now it's, it's where my children find refuge. Property to me is um, something that I never had as a child that I'm able to give to my children that um, I hope contributes to their safety and to their well-being. So God, property to me is a lot. And if I continue to move on to that um, other part of where he asks, um, basically, what's one drop? What's one drop? And my answer to God is, one teardrop for me is an ocean. 
one teardrop from one of my children or one of my friends is an ocean. And some of the very people on this screen have helped my children when the teardrops have fallen. And that means the world to me. What's one drop to me? One drop of blood to me is, is a river. One drop of blood that I didn't have to shed to enjoy the privileges and the, um, the safety and comfort that I enjoy now is a river to me, God. One drop. One drop, whether that drop of blood has fallen due to domestic violence, racism, any other type of discrimination, one drop of blood is like one drop of tear, tears for me. It means a lot to me. And it makes me angry that God asked these questions. Um, the God that I mostly call into my mind would understand that, would certainly understand that um, about the teardrops and the blood, blood drops. I think that the God that I mostly call into my mind would also understand about the property. Um, and uh, this brings me to, to sort of true confession time. When Rebecca asked me to teach this lesson, I was very upfront in saying, Rebecca, I've never read the Doctrine and Covenants before. And she said it was okay if I still taught this lesson. But my um, avoidance of the Doctrine and Covenants has been very conscious because um, phrases and words like this, and we'll focus on some other ones later on in the lesson, they don't ring for me, no me cae bien in Spanish, like they don't hit me right. They don't hit right, like the young people would say. They hit different than the New Testament, than the Book of Mormon do. And, and I think that's okay. I think it's okay that I don't read the Doctrine and Covenants um, unless <laughs> I get assigned to by Rebecca, in which case I have faithfully read these sections, don't worry. Um, but I think that, that that it's okay that the God that I know um, wouldn't ask me this question, especially about the drops. Okay, property, fine, I get it, consecration. I, you know, have my property. I'm, I'm not that into material things anyway. But um, I think it's okay. So the reason why I think it's okay to have these um, phrases or questions put forth by God in, in these sections of the Doctrine and Covenants not hit well with me, not being something that I want to dwell on um, as I build my relationship with Christ and my heavenly parents is because God is not just this God. He's not, or she or whoever they are is not just the God of the Doctrine and Covenants. Um, that I choose to sort of go, mm, yeah, I'm not listening. Um, I know that they are also not just the God of the New Testament or the Book of Mormon that I go, oh, yeah, I like that one. I like that God. And I think too often, even in my own mind, I um, start uh, suffering from binary thinking, right? God is either kind or really kind of, uh, you know what? Um, and it doesn't have to be that way. God can be um, the God that speaks to me. And he can um, also be the God that speaks to these people in the sections of the Doctrine and Covenants. And I think it's healthy to have a relationship with God that works for you, A, and then B, that recognize that God has got to be more complex than just one personality trait. As a parent, I am certainly more complex uh, than one personality trait. Trust me, it depends on literally the time of day. I I'm real good like around noon, but by, <laughs> you know, 4, 4.30, mm -mm, no, I'm definitely the god of doctrine and governance. Like, you're out of here. <laughs> go to bed. I'm tired. Um, so I just, I, I wanted to be honest with you in, in the sense that 
these this the god of the, how he's speaking or they're speaking in these two um sections not my favorite and that's okay i can have a relationship with a variety aspects a variety of of aspects of God and um, the fact that um, in my little mortal mind, I want to just compress God into one gender or one type of personality. Um, it doesn't have to be that way. So I encourage each of us to find the um, find the components of God that work for you, because I am positive that that's what God wants for each of us is to for us to draw closer for him, uh, to him. And so that's why I don't read the Doctrine and Covenants. Okay, now back to our regularly scheduled uh, thing. Oh, there is BYU again, literally. I'm not sure why um, I cannot make this go away. And you know what? I might need to have, um, no, I don't want to save it. I just want you to go away. I might need to have you, Chris, pop over to, um, to your version of the slides. I'll, I'll stop sharing. Let's see if I can do it. I'll try one last time. Yep. Sorry about that. So I'll just have Chris, um, pop over to the slides. Chris, no hurries whenever you can. I have them here on my phone, so it's not a big rush. Oh, look at that. Ah, there Yay. we go. I'll um, have to speed through them to get to where you yes, want. Yes, amazing, amazing. You can just go down to the slide that is right after um, the DNC 117 quotes. And um, I wanted to now move on to this later um, question in those two um, verses that I shared with you. And that's this notion of weightier matters. Um, what are those in, in Doctrine and Covenants, he's chastising, chastising, and saying, you know, how dare you care about property and drops and neglect the weightier matters. So what I'd like you to do as... Um, uh, participants as class members, as students. And um, you can go down a few more slides, Chris, um, to where it says uh, faced with loss. Yes, perfect. So I'd like you all to consider um, these questions. And I promise I'm going to um, turn the time over for you to answer some of these questions that I'm posing to you in, in just a moment. Faced with the loss and contention of today, what are the more weightier matters for you? We know what they were by reading, you know, the historical context and, okay, you got to give up this temple, you got to give up your farms, then you got to go get this money and all, you know, all of that stuff um, back in the Doctrine and Covenants. But what <clears throat> interests me even more is what are the weightier matters for you? Um, especially in these current times of loss and contention. And of course, the question that begs answering, especially from that, those verses in the Doctrine and Covenants, what might you personally need to forsake to attend to those weightier matters? So again, I, if you feel free in the chat, you can chat these answers, you can just jot them down. And in a moment, I'm going to give us time um, to share and to hear from, <clears throat> from you audience members. Ramona, I wanted to share that um, your perspective on these scriptures and on the DNC has, um, ha has really <laughs> just been a revelation to me. And and brought to mind the ways that uh, so many of us approach the scriptures from a position of privilege, uh, that I read these verses and I feel, um, you know, a call to, uh, to reorient my values, um, but, but I haven't lived, I haven't had housing insecurity in my life. I haven't, um, you know, had some of the, the, the pain that, that so many others uh, have had, and and it's and I'm and I'm reflecting on um, 
on how scriptures are often and and God's messages uh, are are intended for different audiences, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm thinking of um, the African American theologian Howard Thurman, and he writes um, a really fabulous, important book in the mid um, century and it's called Jesus and the disinherited. And it's an interpretation Mm -hmm. of the new Testament message that specifically for those who are marginalized and who are disinherited and how, how then do we consider the message of Christ when we're coming from that perspective? And he suggests that there's a very different message for those who are not disinherited. And so I'm struck by that, in the Doctrine and Covenants too, that I really, um, you know, I think that we're conditioned to think of the early saints as part of the disinherited, uh, but in so many ways, you know, maybe they're not. And maybe us as, um, you know, some of us as beneficiaries of that kind of early history um, are not, <laughs> are not disinherited, right? And, and so this flipping the meaning of the, the script and the way um, the p- different perspectives on it has just been um, really powerful for me. So, so thank you. You are so welcome. You are so welcome, Rebecca. And um, Chris, I know I just had you share the screen, but you, you can stop sharing the screen now. I like to see pictures of the people bigger. <laughs> So you can just stop sharing the screen and then I'll have you do it later. Um, yeah, I, I think that's so interesting, Rebecca. And um, obviously I don't do it on purpose. We just read things from our own positionality. And and I do think two things you said brought up, um, you know, the notion of intersectionality. The, these saints back then, they were suffering. I, I do know enough church history to know that. Um and, and yet they were privileged, right? Especially the richer ones who like had farms and stuff to donate and, and things like that. Um, so I think that notion of intersectionality and I think that notion of, of positionality and, and the importance um, that people like you and Chris who run this fancy thing called Dialogue Gospel Studies um, give to you know, not that you're, you have the permission to give, but it is um, meaningful to somebody like me who I can't even pronounce those words <laughs> in those, those verses um, to have like legit Mormons um, say that my position, positionality is okay. That's, that's important for me. And, and I think that um, as each of us comes to realize that I hope that you, each of us um, will, Again, not that permission is ours to give, but but open up the culture of the church, um, open up the scriptures so that they can be all of ours, even if we can't pronounce the words, even if we've never read the Doctrine and Covenants before. This is our church, and um, it's our church just as much as it is anybody else's church. And, um, and I... Yeah, I, I so I agree is what I'm really trying to say. <laughs> um, I wanted to share with you now, and we don't have to share the slides, Chris. I'll just do this so I can uh, see faces. Um, but I wanted to share a little bit about what my weightier matters are. I asked you all to be thinking about um, what your weightier matters are and, and what you might have to forsake to... Um, to fulfill them. And um, I will tell you that, um, as Rebecca said, I am a professor at BYU and I teach multicultural education. And um, I have tenure, so again, a big position of privilege. Um, Going up for full soon, so we'll see if that (laughs) that holds out, but if not, that's all right. But one of the weightier matters that I constantly try to keep in my mind is um, a notion of comity. And my husband, who none of my family could be here, they're all at a homecoming right now, said, you better define that word. And I'm like, oh, these people probably know like 
the Greek version of it or something, but just in case, I'll tell you what it means. So comity is the opposite of enmity. And many of us who have received our endowments um, and ordinances at the temple are familiar with the word enmity, that blockage, that, um, that contention or, or um, anger, right? Um, and comity is the opposite of that. Comity is a sense of... Um, uh, respect of, of peaceful interactions. And the reason why comity, um, it means more than that, but we're just going to go with that for now, is important to me is because often when I am teaching at BYU, I experience, and I'm sure Rebecca, and I'm sure Temu and Heather and Chris, even if you don't experience it in the classroom, um, have experienced a lot of effective polarization. And what effective polarization means is uh, members, uh, partisan people feel distrust and dislike for partisans of a different party, right? And I mean, it's, it doesn't take, it's not rocket science to think liberal versus conservative. And so um, this, this enmity between um, different partisans shows up a lot in my daily teaching experiences and, and wider experiences with um, other folks at, at BYU, um, present company, obviously not included. Um, so if I want to foster comity, if I want to foster respectful and kind interactions rather than enmity between um, let's even just, you know, whatever, pick your topic, liberal, conservatives, vaccinated, unvaccinated, abortion, not abortion, you know, whatever. What do I have to forsake? What do I have to forsake to really put my money where my mouth is? and foster comity over enmity. And so I'm just gonna list some of the things that I feel I need to forsake. And then believe it or not, I'm gonna be quiet and <clears throat> ask for um, some thoughts from you all about um, what you think your weightier matters are um, and what you do you need to forsake. And then tying that back in with those notions of loss that I asked you to consider. Um, earlier of um, property or of contention that broke your heart. So <clears throat> if I really want to, where the rubber hits the road for me in terms of uh, fostering um, comity over enmity um, with people who don't agree with me politically or scientifically or whatever, the first thing that I have to forsake is being right. And let me just tell you, <laughs> that's hard. I, you know, anybody who has um, an opinion knows that that's hard. Um, yet I also know that opinion is the lowest form of knowledge, right? Uh, opinion does not include any level of empathy for anyone else. And so I have got to take a deep breath and I really like summon all my yoganists <laughs> to give up being right. Um, and to consider the value of my willingness to be wrong, even if until the cows come home, I can say, get vaccinated or whatever, you know, whatever the topic is, wear a mask, whatever. Um, <clears throat> but am I willing to forsake being right? Am I willing to consider the value of willing to be wrong so that I can promote Comity. Um, another thing that I need to forsake is my incredible powers of persuasion. Trust me, <laughs> ask my kids. I can persuade people to do a lot of things. I'm really nice. I like to bake treats. You know, I'm I'm good at persuasion. Whether that's sort of the nice Mormon lady type of persuasion or the straight up intellectual, I will go toe to toe with you and probably take you down type of persuasion. I'm really good at it, right? I was trained, anybody who's gone to a doctoral program or any sort of whatever, you know, we are trained to, um, to persuade, but I gotta forsake those great talents of persuasion. 
I have to rather try and practice dialogue, which um, obviously is something that must be special to all of you, because that's what this journal and um, an agenda of, of your organization is, is built around. So, um, so I have to persuade, forsake persuading and really try hard to stay in dialogue, which for me means staying in relationship with people who disagree with me. Another thing that I have to forsake is binary thinking. Vaccines are right and not getting vaccinated is wrong end of story, cannot hear anymore, right? That's usually the binary thinking that um, I go to. Why? Because it makes me right, because I am right. Hello, science people, I'm right. And then what happens? Oh, I get that nice little dopamine hit in my brain. Oh, feels so good to be right. I love it, right? Right? <laughs> yes, of course, I'm right. But dopamine and getting addicted to that little dopamine hit of when I'm right, which of course in binary thinking means you're wrong. Ooh, that's dangerous, right? You can just see the pride um, cycle flaring up with each dopamine hit I allow myself to enjoy by making you wrong so that I can be right. So I have to forsake that type of binary thinking and move to challenge myself to remain in a mindset of, of complexity. Um, and um, one phrase, and I wish I knew who this came from. I should have, if anybody, knows the source of this quote, put it in the chat, but strong convictions loosely held. And I learned about it from the Jody Moore podcast, which like it doesn't get more straight up <gasps> white Mormon lady than that. But hey, that's how I roll. I roll, I, I, I find my sources from various places. Um, but I love this notion of strong convictions loosely held. I can be very... Um, have strong convictions toward uh, vaccines, but I can hold them loosely so that my neighbor who is against vaccines doesn't have to, in my opinion, turn into just a babbling idiot, right? Um, which is usually where I go. Um, so another thing that I have to forsake, and this will be the last one, I'm, um, is... Um, well, this, this notion of uh, if I'm willing to sacrifice or forsake these things that are really important to me, like being right, like using my great talents of persuasion and all of these other things, getting that dopamine hit. Um, if I'm willing to sacrifice these things, then will my sacrifices really be more sacred than my increase? Because, right, isn't that what God is promising these people here in the Doctrine and Covenants, that their sacrifice, that which they forsake, will be more sacred to him than, than that which I held. And um, again, that's hard for me because I feel that God has given me intelligence. I feel that God has given me opportunities to increase that intelligence. Is it really 1045? Oh, my gosh. All right. Sorry about that. Anyways, that's hard. Um, but I got to take a leap of faith and believe that um, that those sacrifices that I make could really be more sacred to him and could really um, foster the weightier matters of, of comity and of love, basically, versus enmity. Um, so let me be quiet now. Um, and uh, hear from, uh, I don't know if you, if anybody contributed to the chat, um, I can go down there and look, but Rebecca and Chris, you, if, if well, there's, a, there's a lot there in the chat and, uh, and Tamu, um, you've, you've contributed a number of things in chat, but you're showing up as closing prayer. If you want to change your name, you can do that and uh, show up as really you. <laughs> we know it's her. She doesn't need any label. <laughs> so I just, I, I had one thought as I was listening to your list of things to forsake, Ramona, that I, um, I was happy that about two thirds were things I had been thinking about. Mm -hmm. So felt like, oh, we're on the same 
we're on the same page. But it caused me to think one more kind of a next step that I find I struggle with is giving up um, how the, in Mormon words, it would be being nice or being agreeable. Um, that is, I want to be, um, I want to be agreeable with my neighbor who is, in your words, not, you know, anti-vax. And I, I that's a hit, that's a, that's a dopamine hit as well. Mm -hmm. and I, and oh, to, yeah. I mean, we have been socialized, right, Chris, whether we're lifelong members or, um, or converts. Um, Mormons in particular, I will say Mormon women are socialized to be nice and to not cause a fuss. And um, yeah, I, I, I hear you. That's a hard one for me. Um, Tamu, other people uh, is, well, are, you know, that might be for me, but maybe it's not appropriate for everybody. You know, this is my list. What do you think, Tamu? Well, I mean, I think that you said some very insightful and powerful things. Um, when I think about uh, if I'm uh, in response to, to Chris, um, for me, I don't, I just have never had the luxury of sitting silent. And, um, and as a woman, women in, in our, in our uh, religious culture, <clears throat> the quiet ones, the agreeable ones, sometimes in some spaces, they become, they're the comfortable ones. And my job is actually not to make men or people around me feel comfortable. That's the comforter's job. And so um, if we are here to aid God in his work um, or the gods, I mean, I, I love the, the uh, Doctrine and Covenant or Pearl of Great Price version of the gods. And so um, if we're here to aid them, then we will say things that make people feel uncomfortable. And I think that we worship in a culture that then reverts back to, oh, we want to make you feel comfortable. So I've been pulled aside several times by bishops because I've said the uncomfortable thing in an effort for that bishop to make that person feel comfortable. And so then that person continues to rely on the bishop for comfort when the bishop is not my comforter, mm. the mm. comforter comforts, and we and, and we are taught that the comforter teaches us lessons. So if we take on the role of the comforter, what lesson do we teach our brothers and sisters that are eternal lessons? It's a dependency on flesh, and we're told. I mean, I revert always back to the Bible. The Bible teaches don't depend on flesh. So in several spaces. And so I, I think about that. Um, and as, as, as um, you guys were speaking, I was actually typing one of the things that I am really grappling with because I have enjoyed being able to gather with people who challenge my thinking and where we can have these open dialogues and these open discussions because that is where my spirit, like I worship in the spirit of fire, like the big, like, and it's not so much the spirit of water where I'm, the Holy Ghost hits me and I'm, and I'm crying, but I'm grappling with how, what return back to church looks like. I'm not looking forward to right now, I'm a Sunday school teacher for the youth, but, and I, I just like to call myself a discussion leader, but I'm not looking forward to returning back and sitting in a Sunday school class with adults. I don't know if I can go back to what was because I know what we as a religious organization, as a religious family can be because I've experienced it and going and attending Sunday school with friends and with people like Ramona and I, I just don't know if I can go back to the status quo in my ward. I yeah. hope my bishop is watching, but he's not because it's state. <laughs> <laughs> and I promise this BYU thing that keeps invading the screen. <laughs> it's just the RRB. It's, it's it's no connection. Um, yeah, you know, and and I think Tamu and Chris putting your two comments in tension. 
might be a real call to action for a lot of us, especially a lot of us who present as like typical Mormon ladies, whatever that means, white, middle class, insert your description. Um, and, and I love that you brought up, oh, you just blew my mind, Tamu, about the, the, why is it my job to comfort? That's, that's the comforter's job. Um, I even um, researched the, the, the emotional work of engaging in a pedagogy of discomfort and translate that into normal language, making a lot of LA white girls feel uncomfortable. That's, that's my job at BYU. Um, and um, I'm gonna share that quote, uh, but the reason why I want to make them uncomfortable is to prepare them to be allies and advocates for people who, whose voices aren't listened to, just like Tamu said, who, uh, who don't have the luxury of remaining silent. And also a lot of people don't have the luxury of speaking out and remaining safe. And so I want to prepare my BYU students. I want to prepare my own children and I want to prepare anyone who will listen to me um, to fulfill that role. Um, and, and it really does, Chris, I hear you. I am pre-programmed to be nice, socialized not only by the Mormon church, but by a real history of domestic violence in which my existence really depended on People thinking I was so nice and so helpful. Um, but those aren't my conditions anymore, right? I'm 50, almost 56. My husband's great. I, I'm not in that physical danger anymore. But I still cling to those um, that persona because it's worked out so well for me. But enough therapy has taught me that I got to live in the present and let go of that inner child stuff and own my power. Like Temu said, maybe be willing to worship a little bit more in fire than water. So thank you. Um, I actually did have another question. Uh, I don't know, 5, 10, 54, you, I, I leave it to you guys. We can keep talking about this. We can just say the closing prayer. I had a whole nother slide that obviously not good on time management. Maybe we'll just pull in some additional comments from the chat. Um, you know, there's a lot of um, uh, folks are identifying with um, kind of this, you know, letting go of opinions, expectations, um, trying to turn uh, the weightier matters to, to Christ's perspective and allowing, um, you know, something different to come in. Mm -hmm. um, there are folks who have uh, talking about kind of losing a sense of hope for the future with the country and as well as sometimes in personal lives, having to let go of control of teenagers mm -hmm. um, and others are talking about um, uh, needing to forsake uh, a kind of preconceived uh, uh, the future um, in order to really um, you know, maybe act in the present and, and um, come with a new perspective. I don't yes, know if my there's fellow control, there. control freaks. I hear you. <laughs> you have been seen letting go of the future and not feeling like I've prepared for every possible contingency. Um, I hear you. Yes. And, and whoever said about the teenagers, um, yes, they will. <laughs> they're a specially crafted <laughs> breed that will bring you right to the recognizing the limits <laughs> of your control. Right. And they, I mean, um, going through this life with them, um, you know, helps to re-identify what the weightier matters really are. Um, and, uh, force us to confront um, kind of new possibilities, some of which we welcome, some of which were unexpected. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, Rebecca, you, you really remind me too that, you know, our BYU students, Rebecca, you and I teach a lot of undergrads and, you know, what are they if not just basically teenagers? And um, I've got to say until I had a BYU age, um, friend 
Hi, Tamu. Thank you so much. She's going to hear her, one of her Sunday school students speak in state conference, which is awesome. Um, I have so much more empathy for my BYU students, even those who exhibit a high level of effective polarization, like Dr. Kutri is a liberal commie wacko. I mean, <laughs> just read my student <laughs> reviews. Um, you know, but they're, they're just like me, right? Their inner child is somehow telling them something that's manifesting in that behavior. And I think that we could all stand to be a little less opinionated and a little bit more empathetic. And again, if I was, a, well, I am a good scholar, but I didn't prepare this in a scholarly manner. So I should have a reference for the quote that says, and I actually do, I just can't remember who it is, that opinion is the lowest form of knowledge because it, um, it includes no empathy whatsoever. So that, that notion of empathy and, and really recognizing that I don't think anybody wakes up in the morning saying, I'm just going to be a big jerk. Um, they wake up in the morning trying to survive and, and we've all adapted certain survival um, strategies, especially in these times. Um, but I do think that what God is asking us to do is to, um, to think of what are the weightier matters. And, and indeed, as these saints back in the Doctrine and Covenants time showed us, um, sometimes the weightier matters aren't life, <laughs> aren't continuing to breathe and have your heart beat or have your children's heart beat and um, have them continue to, to breathe. So that, that willingness to forsake um, was, I was really grateful for having to study these sections and and consider that for myself. Um, I think, um, you know, also folks are um, thinking about the pain um, and the and contention that comes from a disconnect with family. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, perhaps ironically in this venue as we're studying um, scriptures of the Latter-day Saint tr tradition, uh, the, the culture <laughs> of the church and, and having to forsake some, um, some certainty about truth and about um, kind of their relationship to, to kind of the institution. Yeah. And I mean, it was going on back then. The slide that I don't have time to share is basically when that one guy whose name I totally forget now got called out. Ouch. Oh, Newell K. Whitney. I mean, shoot, that that hurts the littleness of your soul. Can you imagine like the God of the universe just like flat out calling you like you're, you're just like the littleness of your soul. What I wanted to do was have something queued up on TikTok where all the kids go, sheesh, because that's like a sheesh if I've ever heard one. Ouch. And in the same verse, God calls him to be a bishop. And we don't have that flexibility anymore, right? It's like, no, Elder Holland is Un, unhuman, right? Whatever he says is just perfect. And if we question otherwise, we're not good members of the church. But back then it was like in the same verse, you get totally called out by the creator of the universe. And then he tells you, or they tell you whatever, yeah, and go be a bishop for me. So, so where's that today, Rebecca? And I'm not asking you, but I think that the, the chat is maybe saying some of that. Like we have no tolerance for complexity anymore. We want our leaders to be perfect and we want them to be perfect all the time. And Rebecca, who is also a friend of my husband, um, very kindly in my introduction left out that I thought that being a bishop's wife was the hardest calling I've ever had because the dude did not turn out to be perfect once he got that calling. He was still the same complex messed up guy that I married and that I continue to love. Um, and so I really want, um, I want my own kids who have been through their various faith journeys um, to recognize that, um, that, that, yeah, our leaders don't have to be perfect 
Um, and I don't have to have this binary, like I'm in the church. And if I'm in the church, that means president or whatever his name, Elder Holland, you know, was fine to say what he said at BYU, or he said that I got to be out of the church now. It's not binary. You can be in the church and think, you know, Elder Holland was probably, I mean, I saw the devotional. I'm sure you did too, Rebecca. He looked like he didn't feel good. He seemed to like he was a little grumpy. That's okay. The guy's old, right? I mean, the dude's like however old. He gets to be grumpy and go off script. And that's okay with me because look at in the Doctrine and Covenants, some guy got like radically called out by God. And then he still got to be the bishop in the same verse. So I just hope we can entertain some more complexity um, in our uh, consideration of our leaders and in the consideration of our, our um, practicing um, of the church, that I am, I'm a practicing Latter-day Saint. I'm, I'm just practicing. I'm not active or inactive. I'm just practicing. And that's going to look different on different days. And again, like I said, 4.30, mama would love a glass of wine and to not be practicing so much because I'm tired and grumpy. But, you know. Okay, I'm going to keep practicing. All right. Uh, well, I think that we'll go ahead and officially uh, close and then maybe continue a little bit of a conversation. But thank you so much, uh, Ramona. Um, and I'm really reflecting here on uh, how these scriptures remind us that, um, that the church is a messy place and there's pain and joy. And, uh, and we are called to... Uh, to do our best to try to rise above and to pay attention to the weightier matters that um, that God wants us to uh, be paying attention to. We'll uh, close with Heather's prayer and then with an invitation for you to join us on our, with our next dialogue gospel study on October 24th with Jonathan Stapley. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the opportunity that we've had to come together as a community and to listen to good sister Ramona. Um, I am personally thankful for her insights and for the call to foster comity and to um, perhaps uh, sit in discomfort and, and see what it can teach. Um, bless us as we go forward this week to look for opportunities to keep practicing the gospel. And um, we uh, also ask for a special blessing on the missionaries. And we say this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.